Okay, let me welcome you all to this conference. Uh, there will be more people filtering in today and many more tomorrow. So we'll be on top of things because you'll already know what we're up to, who we are, what's going on, and so on. But I do want to thank you very, very much for coming. Uh, most of you know me, those who don't, I'm Claire Hill, I teach here. I still can't quite believe I'm in a place that's so cold and snowy since I hate both the cold and the snow. But it's a wonderful law school and it's better than it is back on account of the weather and that says a lot. Rob, however, Rob Henderson, my co-organizer, lives in Malibu. Uh, anyway, more about that, maybe. Um, so, here's my prepared remarks here. Um, I think this is going to be a seriously exciting day in a quarter. Of course, I do. I picked all the speakers. Um, and I do want to mention that we have uh, three wonderful sponsors, Bloomberg, Dorsey and Whitney, and Fabry Baker Daniels. And we have also the sponsorship of the Law School, the Law School's Institute of Law and Rationality, the Law School's Institute of Law and Economics, and our very supportive dean and colleagues. I want to mention one other person, because I hope she's hearing me, is Krista Daskowitz, who is the most amazing organizer in the history of the world. There she is, she heard me. conference and how today and tomorrow are structured. One thing I'm not going to do, I'm general, I'm not going to introduce the speakers. You have their bios, listen to what they have to say, don't listen to me say it. He has 12 titles and he's the fanciest person in town. You'll figure out uh, who they are and you'll also figure out why they're the fanciest person in town by listening to them. So we don't need me to go on about that, just read and file some materials. So what motivated the conference is a desire to be able to use what I think are very, very powerful tools in law economics in ways that take nuance properly into consideration. I used to work at a temple of law and economics, and one of my colleagues used to say to me, an explanation that has more than some small number of factors, somehow it was always an odd number, it was five, seven, three, or whatever, you'd say, it doesn't explain anything because it's too complicated. And okay, one gets that one does not want explanations for as complicated as the thing that one's trying to explain. Um, but I will admit to being very attached to the supposedly Einstein quote, an explanation should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. And this is very much in that spirit. We want to get to the best level of simplicity. How do we do that? Well, hopefully listening to us today and tomorrow will give some sense as to what our answers to that might look, might look like. I'm going to focus, and some of us are going to focus, on just sort of nuance of what goes on in the business world and what kind of explanations we can come up with to explain practice, to as scholars explain what's going on, and also that we can bring to bear in teaching. And so a big hope of all of this is this sort of triumvirate of possibilities. One huge piece of it, and this is Rob's domain, is the tech piece. I mean, it is absolutely dazzling to me what kinds of tech innovations are being arrived at that also are helping in all three of those places to practice in pedagogy and in scholarship. And you're going to hear state-of-the-art stuff on all of these things. And I'm proud to say I have some of the absolute leading people anywhere who do that, who have done me the honor of agreeing to come here, and in this case, agreeing to co-organize with me. Um, very few other things to say here. One of them is that I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in the remainder of today, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's going to happen tomorrow. Today, we're going to get a keynote by Don Langford, who's sitting there. And here's what I want to know about him. I can say that uh, I've heard him speak many, many times, and each and every time I have marveled at his wisdom, breadth of experience, knowledge, and eloquence. And you know, this after 20, 25 times of speaking. Well, I am certain you will 
we'll have the same reaction. So that's the first thing we're going to have happen. He's going to talk for maybe 25 minutes, and then we'll have a discussion after that. We have an opening panel with a bunch of us that's intended to set the stage for today and tomorrow, and for, again, how real-world practice can be better informed by academics taking nuance and tech innovations into account. Tomorrow we've got five panels, one of which is also on tech, and the other four. The first one is called People. It's not quite, but it's basically about people, how they do deals, and it's a little more complicated than you might have thought because people are people. Those of you here who uh, are in my classes now or have taken my classes know what I mean by that. We need to take into consideration, and those of you who came to the showing that uh, we showed the barbarians at the gate last week, and you can just see that the way people are necessarily influences their deal making in very, very interesting ways, and not just ways that are in the realm of psychology, ways that are in the realm of economics, of law, that we can say some more interesting things about it. Because I think we can, I hope we can, and I hope we can persuade you. But that's the case. We have two other panels tomorrow on what's in the document, what's in transaction documents, what's in other corporate documents, what kind of sense can close reads of those and close comparisons of those yield, what kind of uh, sense can tech methods use with respect to them yield. And our final panel is going to be beyond shareholders because one cannot these days, I think, talk about business law without considering whether people other than shareholders are going to be important constituents for what a corporation does. And one needs to consider who those people beyond the shareholders are going to be and how their interests are going to be represented. And as I say, this is a huge new thing now. And it seemed like a fitting way to end this conference tomorrow. And with that, we'll turn it over to you all. Great, thank you. I think we're all here uh, really because Claire had this vision about um, uh, a new movement in uh, legal scholarship that's been taking place that's been looking at sort of the institutional details of uh, legal practice and business law. And um, so we, we're calling it the new realism. Um, and I think it's actually kind of analogous to, for those of you who uh, um, in corporate law, or say the theory of the firm is kind of analogous to the theory of the firm, where once uh, economists saw the firm as just a black box, a production function, it was just it, the only interesting thing about it was that it took inputs and produced output at a certain equilibrium price. Um, and the in, what happened inside of it wasn't really of interest. Um, and I think um, for a long, much later than that, uh, what lawyers do in the business pro, uh, uh, context has been thought of kind of that way as well, a bunch of inputs come in and then a deal comes out the other side. Um, and there's a lot more to it than that, and just like there's a lot more to the firm, uh, because there are human beings involved, there are interests, there is bounded rationality, uh, there, are, there are informational problems, there are organizational problems. And so I think you know one of the things that we're trying to do here, or at least I think the, the vision that Claire had, was to identify the people who are working on these types of problems that arise within the process of lawyering on behalf of businesses or against them, um, and identifying sort of what are what are the actual mechanisms inside that black box that, that that produce the outputs that we see, and then once we learn about that, what can we do about it to either make things better, to address problems develop technologies that will uh, that will um, make that process work better or work better for more people. And so I really uh, I really see this process, this conference is sort of growing out of that growing recognition of a movement of, um, of legal scholarship in that domain, whereas once it was sort of uninteresting what was in legal documents, um, and uh, now it's become sort of the center of study and increasingly accepted into um, into uh, jur uh, visible journals and, and the like. So, you know, I just kind of like, in addition to thanking our sponsor, Bloomberg Law, Fagri, and Big, um, I would like to, um, and Dorsey, I would like to, uh, I'd like to thank Claire for, you know, her visionary leadership on this because without her, not a single one of us would be here. And this is going to be a tremendous conference. I, hope, I think there's something for everybody uh, here, whether you're a student, academic, 
practitioner or whatever, um, I think you will. Uh, I think you'll take something away that will actually be that'll be actionable in in, uh, in your domain. So uh, thank you to Claire. Thank you to Minnesota for. Him. I will say I saw him be inaugurated. What a beetle of how that was. <laughs> okay, thank you, Claire. Um, when Claire asked me to do the keynote address for today, uh, I was flattered and confused. <laughs> uh, flattered for the obvious reasons. Very nice to come to Minnesota and talk. And when I heard about who else was going to be speaking, it was uh, doubly so. Uh, confused because I wasn't sure what the topic of the conference was, and it's tough to give a keynote address about a topic you don't quite understand. Um, new realism, when I first read the, the email that invited me to talk about this, uh, I thought of in lower cap terms, small n, small l, small r. That is to say, what Claire just said. We're thinking through really tough problems in corporate securities and finance, and we're using an increase, an increasingly large toolbox uh, to address all of that. And so we're talking about bigger toolboxes in this conference. Um, okay, uh, that's fine. I consider myself someone who tries to be new and legal and realistic, <laughs> much better than unrealistic and old. Um, but immediately it jumped into my mind that she might mean something completely different. And that is new legal realism in capital letters, because there is a well-established academic genre that has existed for the last decade and a half it calls itself the New Legal Realism Movement and has a much more defined objective. So I was worried, oh my God, I'm going to have to do a knitting together of corporate securities law with the movement we could call New Legal Realism. A movement that uses empiricism, draws from what are called the new governance scholars uh, who are big on experimental and things like that. Um, I decided not to ask Claire what she meant. <laughs> so as to maximize my opportunity to talk about whatever I wanted, uh, rather than go into all of that. Um, so I'm gonna toggle back and forth between capitals and small letters uh, and talk about what I regard as particularly important things that are going on um, in our field today. Uh, corporate legal scholarship is thoroughly interdisciplinary today and has been for a long time. One of the first great moves that took economics, became law and economics, into the legal academy in the 1970s and 1980s was concern about how well corporate law was operating at all. Legal scholars have concluded it is operating miserably. There are races to the bottom. There are abuses of shareholders and stakeholders and others that are pervasive. Then came the economists who say, Markets solve these problems particularly well, but there's no race to the top, either race to the bottom. There's a race to the top, perhaps. If you rethink how you think about corporate law, you'll see things completely different and not in a foolish way that just leads you to trash what you observe um, in the law books and on the ground. That quickly became a lively, exciting intellectual adventure. Are the assumptions of economics, rationality, efficiency, races to the top, accurate descriptors? Or are we talking about 
pathologies within markets that take the race to the bottom or to nowhere in particular. How do we know? And so corporate law became a model for many other fields. In its willingness to ask the question, what do the facts show? Not do what our, our presuppositions show, but what do the facts show? And in that sense, it's almost tempting to finish my talk right now and declare victory because the new legal realism in corporate law exists very well under a very big tent. Uh, but I'm not going to end here because I'm supposed to go for 25 minutes. Um, so let me talk about what would be good examples of state-of-the-art new legal realism thinking in corporate law today. Now, Claire has already set this up. You're going to hear lots of people who fall into this category and hear about their work. I'm just teeing them up in a sense. But let me give you what I think you will regard as a very intriguing example. Um, about a month ago, I was asked uh, to be a commentator on a paper by Josh Mintz, who's a very clever young scholar uh, at Columbia University. Um, he had done some work with Eric Talley, his more senior colleague at Columbia. Um, on the intersection between technology and state-of-the-art thinking and securities regulation. Nice, challenging topic. I love that sort of stuff. And it was nice to be asked to be the commentator uh, on, on that paper. And here's the part of the paper um, that most intrigued me. And as I thought about it in the aftermath of being invited here to talk to you, fits nearly perfectly into what we regard as the best kind of new legal realism work. Now, as a commentator, I have to confess, my job was not to say, this is a really good paper, thank you, and sit down. So I formed my own points of view on this subject, and I'm going to express them right now, um, but I don't want to in any way imply that this is other than exemplary work the sort that should be a model for everything we talk about and do. The part of the paper that most fascinated uh, involved something that we're talking about a lot today, cybersecurity. Cybersecurity breaches, the costs that come from such breaches. And what Josh and Eric had done as a separate predicate project was look at stock price movements in advance of a corporate announcement of a hack of some kind of cybersecurity event. And they found rather dramatic evidence of stock price run-ups in the month prior to the announcement of the breach, from which we normally um, assume some insider trading must be going on there. There could be other things happening. Market prices are very noisy. They can move funny ways. But no, this was strikingly uh, strong data about price runs. So the question then becomes, and if you're an SEC person like I am, you'd be fascinated to you know, get tapes and run names through and things like that. But who's doing the trading? Who's buying up in advance? And we could only speculate about that without better data uh, until we had the Muddy Waters St. Joe's Hospital revelations that came out two years ago. And that was the revelation that a hedge fund, a very large hedge fund, was financing the attempted hack in order to locate cybersecurity abuses or vulnerabilities. And they were also taking a short position in the stock, which shows up in the stock patterns I'm describing to you, such that simultaneously they reveal publicly that 
St. Joe's, and these were pacemakers. This is not, you know, this is health-related, life-related stuff. Um, they would simultaneously release the success of the hack and that they were going to tell St. Joe's how to fix it. And I'm bad people. But needless to say, the stock price drops considerably. Uh, and any short seller at that point closes out the position and has made a lot of money. Is that insider trading? Mints and tally ask. What does that data, in other words, lead us to? And the answer is not obviously. To trade based on information that you have some ownership right over, that you in a sense legitimately possess, is not insider trading. Insider trading asks whether you misappropriated the information from somebody else in breach of a fiduciary responsibility or hold a breach of fiduciary responsibility to other people trading in the market, none of which works in a case like this. Now, for those of you who are insider trading fans, you know this is not the first time the SEC has encountered hacking. There have been a number of hacking, not cybersecurity breach cases, but other just hacking into company uh, disclosure platforms. And so there's a body of law on this that suggests that if the hacking takes the form of tricking the host computer into thinking it's authorized entry, when it really isn't, that even without regard to a fiduciary duty, that's deceptive. And Rule 10 b 5 says deception in connection with the purchase or sale of any security is a 10 b 5 violation. So if, this is the big question, this is the techie question, if you can aptly characterize getting into the St. Joe's pacemaker software as tricking it, you have a shot at insider trading. Otherwise, no shot. What I particularly liked about the paper was what it then does next. We could, many people writing about this would, stand up and scream, this is why Congress needs to fix the insider trading laws. Isn't this stupid that Muddy Waters, the hedge fund, could get such an advantage without running afoul of laws that are meant to promote the integrity, the evenness of the playing field of the stock markets. And indeed, there is a bill before Congress right now. Senator Jim, our Congressman Jim Pines from Connecticut uh, is the author. That would take the standard that I described to you, the one that doesn't easily work, in bad hacking cases like this, and substitute for it a prohibition on any exploitation of an informational advantage gained by either criminal or otherwise wrongful behavior. And you can see how, in light of how technology is evolving, that gives us a potentially better mechanism for addressing these things. But wait, there's more. Because the paper, very much in the spirit of new governance and new legal realism, says, are we sure we want to do that? Right now, there are many companies with vulnerable cybersecurity systems. And those vulnerabilities are going to be discovered by a hedge fund, who is willing to hand over the patch, or maybe some terrorists, or maybe a rogue state. You want the good guys discovering the vulnerabilities before the bad guys do. And if we use our insider trading tweaks to prohibit this 
kind of behavior? Well, then who are we going to be leading? These matters to and what will be the long-term consequences. And that's a really interesting question. I was bothered by the last part in the sense that I think whether or not hacking is deceptive, hacking is a federal crime, broadly defined. And to allow people to gain insider trading profits from the commission of the federal crime strikes me as expressively bad, which would be another layer, the new legal realism uh, would take us to. But it struck me as I was preparing this team on, you know, stress, that what Josh and Eric were doing is really exemplary. It starts with data analysis that the people have done before, makes a discovery about what's explaining the data, and then goes through the various possibilities of getting to a good public policy, getting, figuring out what the right thing to do uh, in a situation like this uh, really is. So, that's my first example. As I thought more about new legal realism at the corporate securities law, my mind turned, and we're going to have a panel about this tomorrow, so your minds should turn as well, to the ever interesting question that corporate law is built on, which is to what purpose, or what purpose does the corporation serve as a matter of law? Is it the received model of the shareholder, shareholder primacy? Is it some stakeholder um, theory? Is it something else? And of course, the recent business roundtable pivot away from shareholder primacy in the direction of stakeholder primacy or something else like that. It is a great exemplar of this kind of issue. Um, I've been doing a lot of work on this lately, and this, my work struck me as, again, touching on so many of the themes that it made sense to address uh, in a conference like this. To answer the question, what is the purpose of the corporation? You have to load some content into it. What are we going to do once we decide the answer to the question? Presumably the answer is we are going to reorient the law so that the law asks for greater fidelity to whomever the greater good is, stakeholders, all of us, shareholders, whatever you decide. Many corporate lawyers have been struggling with that question for decades. It has simply come to a head more recently with lots of current events that pose these questions. And again, you're going to hear a lot about this uh, on a panel tomorrow. As I look into the subject, one of the questions I wanted to ask, because of work I'm doing on compliance and corporate governance, is what is the culture of the corporation say about the question of for whom we're working, to whom we owe our fidelity? Now, there are all sorts of theories about that. Theories, economists say, agency costs. We must, as a practical matter, organize corporate law so as to bring a variety of tools, litigation, voting, things like that, to bear so that managers realize they have a single laser-focused obligation to maximize the long-term value of the securities in the name of its shareholders. Put that all in capital letters. Now, that's a normative claim. Sociologists, by contrast, have long said that notion of agency cost, that notion of fidelity to shareholders, 
is a long-headed hijacking of the law in the name of what was simply a power play. Big money, Wall Street and institutional investors, shifting focus and demanding that kind of fidelity. If you believe the latter, the sociologist approach, then you would say what we would like to do is reorient, bring it back, and we would bring back a golden era before the hijacking, before the intervention by Wall Street and short-termers and big money, in the name of corporations that serve us all and do so fairly naturally. So is the claim. That's one of the biggest arguments there is in the interdisciplinary subject, subjects of corporate and securities law. My project, focusing particularly on corporate culture, assumes that answering this question, the purpose question, would be illuminated, or the, the task of, would be aided by finding out what officers, directors, and senior managers really believe about who they are serving in carrying out their immense power um, and authority. That's an empirical question, the kind of thing that the new legal realism so loves to think about. How would we not? We could, of course, theorize and say, well, if we assume that all people maximize self-interest, um, there are certain things that are going to follow such that you need strong shareholder funds. Yeah, and sociologists say no. Well, how would they do it? How would they look into this question? And the answer is ethnography and the other tools of sociology and some allied subjects that either live deeply in the organization to observe it or do structured interviews with key personnel, a snowball kind of uh, tactic, or do general surveys. In other words, ask people. One of the great but somewhat not surprising interventions of the new legal liberalism movement was, don't guess what people think, ask them. Gee, that was hard to figure out. <laughs> but when you think about it, that's much too simple an answer. Because there's a, I've been talking about the sociologists and the economists, let's introduce the psychologists, who also play a big role in the new legal realism movement. When you go inside a company and observe, what are you gonna see if you're trying to elicit, what does this culture here think about for whom they exist, what they're trying to accomplish? Observing naturally affects the observer, and frankly, good luck asking as a researcher, can I shadow the CEO for the next six months? <laughs> because I really want to observe everything he or she is doing up close and personal. It tends not to happen. Well, not that. What about surveys, interviews? Same thing. Psychologists will tell us that when you ask somebody a question, the answer isn't meant simply to be a, a, a reflection of reality. It often is the product of schemas and scripts, rationalizations that go on in people's head, stuff that make them believe in something. It may not be entirely realistic, maybe myths, maybe self-deception, rather than um, some representation of reality. Once you see the complications associated with digging into 
something like the corporation's culture on the question of why are they there? What are they trying to accomplish? To understand both the importance of the toolkit that Claire was talking about on how to study these things, but also the immense difficulties. Why it is that as hard as you look, as smartly as you ask, you may not get um, the right answers, with the right in quotation marks. Indeed, the more we learn about the psychology of corporate executives, the more you wonder about what it is that the truth is at all. Is it penetrable? Those of you who have heard my stories in, in the last six or eight months, there were a few of you here, uh, I apologize, but I've become fascinated by a recent neuroscience study about how people, this is general population, I don't need to say, this is CEOs necessarily, uh, respond to repeated attempts to get them to cheat a little bit. This is called the slippery slope problem. Those of you who know about slippery slopes understand that it's human nature when you're tempted to say, I will not cheat, to cheat as a capital C. I'm not that kind of person. But if it's stepping over the line a little bit, usually your mind can find a reason. But we know that once you step over the line, your mind moves. And the next time you're asked to do this, you don't step any further over the line, but you move it even further from its starting point. Many theories of compliance failures are built off of um, this kind of research. Well, some neuroscientists decided as people were taking those little steps down the line, what was happening in the part of the brain that regulates cheating, the amygdala, the one that is activated when we get nervous and potentially guilty and are stressed by being put in the face of temptation? And the answer is that first one, your amygdala is old enough. But if you step over a little bit, the next time you're presented with temptation, the amygdala is a little dimmer, showing a little less activity. And again, and again, and again, until the amygdala dims to darkness. I think that's a wonderful metaphor for thinking through questions like in CEO suites, where people are repeatedly tempted to do all sorts of things. What the consequences of a person honestly saying, I would never take this big step but I am taking this big step to make the look dims. Over the course of um, months, years, the consequences in terms of what is believed to be right, what constitutes appropriate behavior to see Wells, Wells Fargo uh, within the firm can become very much distorted. So I think these are all the building blocks that Claire's talking about. Learning more about neuroscience and sociology and the psychology of what happens and putting it to work in a very multidisciplinary way to solve corporate and securities financial law problems um, that we all face. So what's the role of lawyers in all of this? In a sense, the movement toward empirical legal studies that sent our field in the direction of, I think, far greater sophistication and uh, realism, 
um, does at first glance suggest lawyers should sit on the sidelines and let the professional sociologists, the professional um, economists, the professional psychologists do the work. Because you lawyers are not properly trained at this, unless you have a PhD on the side, or more legal academics do. But unless you have that training, you know, you're not big enough to ride this ride. So sit over in the corner. But in a really interesting, and I commend this to you, uh, as I was thinking about my assignment in terms of new legal realism and capitalists. Um, an article assessing that genre um, by Brad Garth and Elizabeth Mertz, who toward the end of the article talk about the role of lawyers and say, yeah, the professionals are the ones with the training, knowing the methodologies, understanding the presuppositions. But lawyers are very good at being brokers among all of those intellectual claims. Lawyers understand what they know and what they don't know, and understand the temptation that we all have, whether standing in a courtroom or anywhere else, to overstate our case. And there are lots of social scientists whose work we draw from, who overstate their case. We're good at seeing conflicts of interest. A recent study about corporate compliance programs and the organizational culture surrounding that, what I'm fascinated by, uh, points out that there was being a lot of social science progress on the question of what constitutes a healthy corporate culture until psychologists and sociologists started being hired as consultants for every big company. And there was money to be made, not by doing good science, but by packaging a nice program that the board of directors could check the box and say, if the organizational sentencing guidelines ever ask, we care, because <laughs> look at what we did. Yeah, um, lawyers should know better than to overclaim. Uh, and so I want to end with this thought uh, as I was going back over the Josh Mintz, Eric Talley, insider trading, kind of my own inquiries into corporate cultures, compliance programs, and things like that. What is it the honest broker does? The lawyer who isn't specialized in anything and therefore has the greater freedom to wander more broadly looking for that which is truly valued rather than overhyped. And I think in the end, that's the role I want all of us to be thinking about over the course of the rest of the day and tomorrow. How lawyers can take this learning and make claims based on their own honest brokering ability. Sometimes it's like being an intellectual short seller. You know when to get out of an idea. <laughs> Knowing when to get, get out of an idea is a really good skill to have. And I think it's one that's going to be in the background of a lot of what we're talking about over the next and a quarter. Thank you very much. I was the edge of my seat metaphor I've been speaking for this. I'm going to very boorishly take moderator's prerogative and ask two questions and then open it up. Or I should say tell one story and then ask the question. So um, this reasoning of we want to motivate these people to be the good guys who just want money as opposed to blow things up to look for hacking reminded me uh, of somebody once said to me, we really need to keep um, drugs illegal, you know, we're have illegal drugs illegal. And I said, but why? You know, usual reason, usual reason. They said, you don't understand, there's all these kind of criminal people 
And drugs, other than the fight for territory, they're relatively harmless relative to what those people would otherwise be doing, like arms smuggling or maybe, you know, biochemical warfare or something like that. So we want to keep the big bucks in the drug smuggling yeah. stuff. And it's sort of very, you know, once you start going down this path, it's kind of an interesting one to say, well, we think this is a bad thing, let's say illegal drugs, but on balance, there's all sorts of evil effects of making yeah. drugs illegal. But on the other hand, if we keep them illegal, we'll keep people whose temperament is such that they look for illegal things doing this illegal thing rather than some more harmful illegal thing. Yeah. And it's not ridiculous reasoning, it may be absolutely right. What we think of it as a society is more complicated given some of your, you know, expressive this and that. But I just wanted to give that as a correlative example. Yes, very good. Um, you know, my pushback on all this is you could say the same thing about hedge funds that finance somebody to go and burn down a company's principal place of business. <laughs> Having shorted the company's stock, just uh, you know, I, 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 I would <laughs> say that's that's encouraging better fire safety, yes, right. or, or, or something like this. Yes. Um, so you know, he's taking me in, in, in a bad direction, and I'm fairly confident that yeah, they were criticizing the Heinz bill. I, I like the Heinz bill as an insider trading substitute, uh, legal substitute, um, but the expressive one. Why do we have insider trading law at all? Is where this takes you, yes. and that's the fun part about the paper. Is you, you have a, you start with data, and then you get a surprising explanation for the data, and very quickly you are asking that question: What are we doing here in the first place? Uh, and that's good stuff. Good scholarship. Yeah. Okay. The other point that I want to make is the following. So, um, Don and I are very like-minded on the. People are complicated, but we've got to figure something out. We can't just say, ah, they're too complicated, nor could we go into just, let's, you know, get into these super uh, complicated explanations that don't get anywhere. And I just wanted to give an example of something I read today that illustrates. So our first thought is, you know, when you deal with people, you have some sense, are they going to be more cooperative? Are they going to be more truth telling or not? And different people have different priors on this. First about people generally, second about classes of people. My former dean and George Mason thought people from the government were always liars, for instance. Um, and you also might have particular things based on your experience with people. So it's there's all sorts of possible variations, and these reflect themselves enormously in when you contract with somebody. If you contract with somebody who you think is an oily so-and-so, you're going to try to be totally bulletproof about it. But even that, which is very expensive, may not help because they're making all these promises. So they won't keep them. So what you say is, well, OK, put a pot of money here. Uh, and make a pot of money available. They say, well, that's nice. And you say, you know, okay, how do I get at this pot of money? So then you need to actually go through the mechanisms of finding a third party who you trust as well. So very expensive um, to feel strong sense of distrust. Some people feel it at an issue more than others. But here's an example I saw today. We'll immediately see what this is an example of. I will admit to being hooked on certain Twitter feeds. And it was a legal related story. So this guy who is apparently somewhat of an unsavory lawyer uh, screws up and doesn't come to some deposition he's supposed to be conducting or something like this. He's about to be sanctioned because it's a very bad thing to not turn up. And then he claims his grandfather died. And, but he's already done some kind of oily thing. So they suggested to him, you know, can you, you know, demonstrate that the grandfather died? And so he writes him another letter. How dare you suggest my grandfather didn't die? And then various other things happen. And things transpire. He keeps writing these letters. And finally, they just say, look, we do not believe that your grandfather died. Anybody else who told us the grandfather died, we give them the benefit of the doubt. But given what we've come to learn about you, we bet the grandfather didn't actually die at all. And I mean, it's sort of an interesting trajectory because it's the back and forth where they come to realize that you know, if they asked this guy where the bathroom was, they probably wouldn't believe that either. And several lessons about that. First is that everyone's prior is that people don't lie that much. 
So that's kind of, yeah. and then the question is, insofar as you have that prior as a starting proposition, what's enough to make you see it? It took them a while here because it's like, this guy's a lawyer, he's been representing people, he's got a law degree, this and this. Can it really be? But after a while, after, you know, nine times of him claiming this about the grandfather and just seeming more incredible each time, they just finally said, we won't believe you about anything. And again, it's an interesting thing because while we may not be able to figure out that much about lying and truth telling and so on, we can certainly figure out that people have different priors. We can about people generally, about people in their groups. We can uh, detect great activity with respect to who trust is more trusting, who's less trusting, and all sorts of things that help us understand much better. For instance, certain kind of contractual contractual devices when they're used, and so on. Anyway. Yeah, speaking of grandfather's diary, one of the most amusing stories uh, I've read about out of the psychology literature um, points out that when students are taking a course and deadlines are looming, grandparents have an incredibly high risk of dying. <laughs> it's like a public health hazard. <laughs> Giving assignments, giving exams like that. Yeah. I, I had seven students once in a class, and three of them had been grandfathers within 10 days of the paper deadline. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, so, one of them was a grandmother. So, let's look John. Sean. Sean. So, like you, Don, I, I'm interested in this culture question. And um, so, I guess I would ask you this like, so when you, when you ask the question about what culture is, does it, how much does it matter what the influences are that are shaping the culture? Um, so I can imagine a culture, like one type of culture, that is responsive to uh, regulators and enforcers. Mm -hmm. and, and then I can imagine another kind of culture that's responsive to the threat of an intervention from an activist or a takeover. And, um, and I can imagine those being different for different kinds of companies. Like for example, a very large pharmaceutical company like Pfizer or whatever, doesn't have all that much to fear from takeover, maybe a little bit from activism, but certainly has a lot to fear from regulation and enforcement. And then other kinds of companies, maybe mid-tier companies or other kinds of companies that could be combined with other companies have much more to fear from, uh, I guess, I mean, fear and importations from ac uh, uh, acquisition or uh, activism. And so my question really is, like, how much should we think about culture as a response to the environment of constraint. And if we're thinking about it in that way, aren't we thinking about the theoretical parameters that we sort of started with? Yeah, um, and in a sense, everyone in the room can now sleep for the next 15 minutes because we just hit what you hit every time you talk about culture, which is, what do you mean by culture? <laughs> yes. And then you and I have to work that out before I can answer your question. Um, and when you do research on the definition of culture, believe me, you need more than 15 minutes of sleep. Uh, okay. Uh, my interest, because it is in what's what I would call sustainable and durable cultures, that which are not simply instrumental responses to an external threat. Yeah, I mean, if, if some country declares war on you, it's going to have cultural effects. Uh, but in no sense are you going to internalize values that legitimize those things. In fact, just the opposite, usually. Um, so I'm interested in how common values among the key management team in a corporation evolve. Um, and I talk a lot about those external threats, including shareholder activism. That's one part of the paper. Government threats of criminal prosecution or deferred prosecution agreements and things like that. Um, just to jump to the bottom line and skip the next three hours, yeah. uh, my hypothesis, the one I'm most comfortable with, is senior manager, managerial corporate cultures um, do not value either stakeholders or shareholders. <laughs> um, that the prime mover in the evolution of a culture is survival. Um, getting to a place where the company's going to be around. So if it involves uh, giving in to the institutional investors uh, on some issues, giving ground a little bit, it's going to look like an embrace 
of a shareholder primacy culture. Yeah. But it's going to be not that at all. Can I just talk? Uh, yeah, go. To sure. Sure. Yeah. So, I, you know, so I one time heard you give a talk about, and you mentioned the Panopticon. Yes. Uh, and, right. and, and you were talking about, and you were talking about the work of Tom Tyler. And you were saying when you have too much of a surveillance yes. state inside right. the firm, then, um, then you, the kind of culture that is kind of norm, not, I don't want to say norms-based or something like that, like the kind of internalized culture as opposed to externalized rule-oriented culture right. isn't possible anymore because it's sort of technologized or something. And, and that makes a difference for how those firms can structure their culture versus other kinds of firms. Yeah, I'm going to assume there's still a culture. It is going to have to be in the shadows and if you have it asked me to assume that Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon leaves no shadows, um, then I have to concede you're right. But I don't think we're anywhere near that in any modern American business enterprise. Um, so you know, it, it's what, what are the beliefs in the shadows? Um, moving away from the incentive forces that I think Economists will often describe as cultural influences, but they are in fact incentives. Uh, and, and I don't want to confuse uh, incentives with, um, with culture. Um, yeah, and, and you know, as far as Tom Tyler's work, it, it's been very inspirational to me um, on the point that the more the panopticon is there, and you know, I do a lot of work in the financial services industry. I, I go to companies and watch the desktops of a financial advisor or registered representative today in terms of what somebody inside that computer is seeing and doing with that data uh, on a real-time basis. Uh, it's got to have effects. Motivational crowding out you know, is, is a common explanation. Okay, we have time for two more questions. Uh, I survive will not, do you mean survival as a as the executives perceive it with respect to their own long-term survival. So if you're thinking about that, then it, it starts to explain the oversight of some things. If you think about Google, for example, yeah. and why they felt that they should pay off all of these executives who were involved in significant amounts of either harassment mm -hmm. of their employees or including their chief legal officer, like having relationships with lots of employees. Right. And why now, as they push them out, they feel like they need to like step in and clean it up, like hire lawyers and clean it up, right? Um, at, at what point, though, does it get to a place where, I guess, whatever bad things are happening <coughs> are so bad that it affects their perception of their survival and turns them into doing things that make people so Um. I mean, both can coexist. Um, they're, they're highly situational. Um, you know, what most psychologists do when they're trying to talk about the, the cognitive content of a corporate culture, because by the cognitive content, is look at how individuals react under stress. Uh, and so what you've just described, if we take it down to the level of a single individual, a corporate executive or anybody else, is the overwhelming temptation as your first move to put it under the rug, hide it, the cover up, which is always worse than the crime as we're kind of consistently told. Um, but you know, that rarely works very well. And it's often uh, a response to a threat that does not by any means produce high quality cognition. Um, I think normally, absent that kind of crisis, I would extend out the time horizon for the survival instinct. Uh, I've never been able to articulate well this idea, but I have this insight, that when the typical senior vice president, you know, senior management, C-suite type person shows up to work, what they realize is they're going to accomplish in the next 24 hours relatively little of the work of the business. It's mainly going to be done by layers of people below them. 
And if you have their loyalty uh, and you have their buy-in and you share their beliefs, and it's got to be a two-way street, uh, chances are the culture and the group will behave in a way consonant with your own wishes. Uh, so it's that survival, not infinitely into the future, but survival that comes from, okay, I might not be around here, but the people working from me, for me are, and I need their beliefs, and in a sense I need to mirror their beliefs in, in what I ask of them. So I'm agreeing in, in five different ways with what you just said. Okay, there's another question. Um, thank you for coming today. Um, so I have like a more general question. Sure. Yeah, because I'm a lawyer, as you said, like we have a bigger toolkit um, in a new a realism. Yeah. But it's also the same for all those bankers. And they have like bigger and more complicated tool toolkits. For example, I think a very good example is the CDS and the uh, supply crisis in 2008. And what laws can do, it seems like the firefighters after the disaster has already happened. So I'm wondering, is there any way we can foster a kind of foresight instead of an insight in this very specific yeah. industry? Um, I, Claire and I would have to fight for wanting to talk about the financial crisis, the corporate cultures, and the future of ethics. We've both written extensively on the subject. Yeah, the New York Fed, uh, there's actually a white paper available uh, that they have produced on exactly your question uh, and taking the position. Your question is very thoughtfully articulated and we have to respond to it. The ex ante culture building that is required so that you don't have the slips down the slippery slope uh, and, and all of the other things that um, led to the crisis. Uh, that, that's the topic sentence. Um, you know, I suggest reading the paper, but um, yes, absolutely. Uh, what you want to build is a culture that embraces the long run, um, not just on a survival basis, but on something more noble than that. Um, but when you're paying people bonuses um, based on performance, and those bonuses are obscene, uh, how you're going to say, and by the way, here's our nice, flowery form of culture, uh, and get that to have any influence uh, is, is a challenge. Well, I got to add to that because you were talking about Josh Mitz at some length. Yeah. And Josh Mitz turns out to have written a really interesting paper that he before he was an academic. You must know this one, the Flip That House one. Mm -hmm. So his idea, and this totally ties in with Rob and with our other theme of tech is that there ought to be, regulators should put into place algorithms that can recognize trends, uh, such as, he said, for instance, before the crisis, there was a spike of people using the term flip that house. And so, of course, the obvious question to ask him is, how do you know to look for that? He said, you figure out how to train the algorithms to what to look for. And he said, then you would have seen this big spike in people doing flip that house, and the regulators would have said, ah, there's a real problem and go on. So we've got both, let's see if we can do stuff with the culture. And my facetious suggestion on that one is actually virtual reality glasses that gets everybody to be empathetic. And then we've got Rob's brilliance from that, and, and, and that's brilliance that can then perhaps come up with the algorithms by which the regulators can be more effective at anti and putting out the firewall. It's both smoldering and before it's taken over the economy. Okay, so we're taking about a 13 minute break and we'll see you Thank you.
there are I'm real like, like, I may or you may not six months from now, they're not exactly the same, and they can change rapidly over five or ten years. years. And, and, and so, I think it's like that. That's why I, if I don't have an answer, I can't schedule 15 CEOs to open their door to me, so I have a question. So I don't know how to handle that one. More than once. <laughs> well, let's get it long term. Survival, but with a variable time. Uh, 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 yeah, no. He has said that. Very nicely, very explicitly, and has some different assumptions than, than I have. Other things, they're not great. I said this three years ago, <laughs> so I get you know I get the professional jealousy that comes. Uh, so I'm citing him. He didn't cite me, but he now is a legend. Yes, right. Yes, I'm 
point out that there's the tech piece that's coming and the fine-grained uh, non-tech piece first. And second, tell you two things uh, that are actually both slightly tech that are going to, I hope, set the stage for what we're going to talk about. Two examples that relate very much to what Don had to say. One of them is, he was talking about looking into people's brains and see what parts light up and don't. One uh, set of articles that I've seen looks at people's brains and determines whether or not the people think of some other person as within their community or other. Think about how powerful that is with respect to the effects of what you're doing if you are in a contracting relationship or in a business relationship. If you think of just about everybody else as other, then you think of your relationships as completely transactional. And perhaps other people doing business with you may again want to have very extensive, not just contracts, but also assurance mechanisms. Or you might think that people are more broadly in your community. And again, the idea that one could actually tell on a continuum where people might be by looking at their brains, it's not there now. But people are looking and they're probably going to learn a bit more. One other story. Um, the uh, International Swap Dealers Association form. Now, we call in corporate law and in transactions, we call 
um, a lot of things forms. When people go and they say a junior associate is told, here, use this form, mark up the form for an acquisition agreement. The things are called forms, but they're not actually forms. They're the thing that the person they're working with has used on the other deal, and they have generally the same elements, but not word for word. By contrast, the ISDA form really is a form. That is, it is written exactly the same way, exactly all occasions. Now, people who do these deals or have done these deals, this is a bit of a historical story, they just send around the form and then the addendum has all of their individual terms. I know someone who was involved in a deal where for some reason he decided to check whether the thing that was really an absolutely inviolate form was actually the right form. And what he found was that the people had very deviously moved around the text so that the beginning words and the ending words were exactly the same, and they had changed the words in the middle. And this was, right, I mean, this was absolutely shocking. So first, of course, this made them believe that the other side was completely untrustworthy. I mean, in theory, anyone else could have done this before, but it was against the very deeply held norms. And so I thought, well, that's very interesting. And obviously, it affected the, com the comportment of that deal going forward. But to me, the interesting question was, so what are you going to do next time? And so I asked him, I said, so do you now read all those forms? He said, oh, no, I couldn't possibly do that. So that's interesting. Here, the stickiness of the norm, the idea that no one else would do this, didn't budge, notwithstanding that someone clearly had. And there's a lot that one can unpack with a story like this. But I just want to leave that as a prelude to getting people to talk about sort of seeing what's going on in the world and then trying to understand it. In a way, you might think my friend was being an idiot because he already knew this was possible. And so how could he not check for it? On the other hand, as I was saying in my previous example of the guy who you can't trust to tell you where the bathroom is, you can't function that way. It's absolutely paralyzing to have that level of distrust. So in a way, he had no choice. And in a way, it was perfectly rational for him to think that the general norms would govern. Anyway, so with that, let me then just uh, start to say this the people that I have invited are people who look closely at what's going on and with a firm foundation in theory, they nevertheless say, what can I explain using theory? How will I have to try to tweak my theory? And I wanted to start with Brett because he is, was a real PhD economist. So he started from the purest of pure theories is in beautiful abstract models. And look where he is today, sitting next to me. So. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't so beautiful. Um, uh, so this isn't why I prepared at all, but I just have to tell this story after the one you just told. So my husband um, used to do mortgage-backed securities, which were at the heart of the, the crisis, so he doesn't do that anymore. I told um, my students this story yeah. yesterday. So, uh, and, and, and it puts together long, long, complicated flows of where the money goes. And if, it, if this doesn't, it goes here, and then if there's more left, it goes here, and it goes here. It's sort of a long, complicated flow of, 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 of money flows. And, and, and he works with several of dozen people putting together the prospectus describing this. And he sort of got the feeling that people weren't really reading this all that carefully. And he just wondered about it. Uh, so at one point in one of the drafts, um, he inserted his name as getting like a million dollars or something <laughs> like that uh, uh, in the flow and, and sent that around. Um, and people came back with comments and some, and no one, only one, per, one person had uh, scratched out his name and put that person's name in place. <laughs> uh, but no one else, no one else noticed it. So I, I, I don't think this was done for nefarious purposes, but it, but it, it was another example of people not reading. Um, and this wasn't just boilerplate. This was really the operative part of the document where you were where you were deciding who got what money. Um, uh, anyway, that's not my point. Um, uh, so I just thought I'd, I'd say a couple minutes about sort of my trajectory, how I came from 
economic theory to, to what I do now. So the, the topic that sort of I've always been interested in and, and, and want to work on um, as corporate governance and in particular the role of employees and maybe other stakeholders as well, but above all employees uh, in being involved uh, in corporate governance. I decided uh, I was going to be an economist and that I, I wasn't thinking about law at all. Um, in fact, law was sort of like the bad, the dark side. Um, uh, uh, and so did a, a, a dissertation called Labor Managed Firms and Banks. I was interested in the uh, Mondragon um, uh, cooperatives in, in Spain, which are one of the most successful groups of cooperatives in Spain and at their heart is a is a uh, um, a cooperative bank that helps form and support uh, the cooperatives. And I wanted to come up with sort of the economics of why why that made a difference and how that could explain why in other places that don't have that structure, you don't see um, uh, cooperatives. So to do a dissertation in economics, um, you could either do theory or you could do uh, regressions. Um, and when I was a grad student, theory was more prestigious and uh, uh, although that's less true nowadays, but it was more prestigious then, plus I was completely hopeless at regressions. So, so I, did a theor I did a few little theoretical models of various elements of what I thought the argument was for how the, the firm bank um, relationship uh, made a difference, but I must admit I was not very, you know, I, I didn't think I was shedding a whole lot of light uh, on anything. And at, at the time, I, I really felt like, you know, what would be a lot more interesting and useful, and I would learn a lot more and be able to say more. So if I just like went to Spain and talked to people, um, uh, sort of relating to some of uh, something Don was talking about at some point in the keynote uh, about what was going on and why it was going on. Uh, but that's not what economists did, and that's not what you're trained to do. So I wrote the theory papers, and by the end of the dissertation, I, I A, was not convinced in this is a methodology, and B, if I'm being honest with myself, I also wasn't very good at it. So um, I decided to uh, switch to something else and saw that there was this law and economics thing where I could use, the, the, the training wouldn't have been completely wasted, I, but I could write about, um, uh, 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 about uh, the stuff I was interested in with a broader methodology still informed by the economics. So that's what I did. So I went to law school, got a JD. Before I started teaching, I spent a couple years in practice, just like two years in practice in San Francisco in the late 90s during the dot-com boom. And I will say, I feel like I learned much more about what goes on in businesses and how businesses are run and corporate governance, much, much more about that in the two years in, as a lawyer um, than I did in like six years um, doing the economics theory. I mean, the economics was useful in many ways, but I really learned more about what's going on in those two years. So one thing economists, our lawyers bring to the table um, beyond any sort of academic toolkit is just the toolkit of having been in practice for some time and being in contact with people in practice for some time, and I, I, I want to stress that. Last points I'll make about sort of my own and tying into that in my own. Uh, so I, over time, I've been writing papers that are less and less economics, more and more law uh, as time goes along, but still informed by the theory. But two sort of experiences I've had recently uh, that 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 make me wish I'd had a different kind of preparation than the economics. So I still value that. Um, uh, is one uh, being involved in for my first time in um, helping draft the statute on benefit corporations. Corporations, uh, which is a new legal form for social enterprises, um, uh, where again the sort of a different element of the practice, um, uh, the role of practice, gives you sort of a whole set of insights that you um, you don't get um, doing the, the theory. Uh, and then the other thing, um, going back to my desire to eventually talk to people, I'm now working on sort of climate change and activism surrounding disclosure. Uh, surrounding climate change, where we finally, myself and the people I was talking to, decided we'll just go out. We, we, we did interviews with both people and companies and investors uh, who are involved in that to try to figure out what are you doing and what kind of effect is this ultimately having on how businesses actually change what they do. And I don't know if I really got the sense of what they are. So one if what question I would have asked Don is, yeah, how do you actually get at the real underlying truth of what they're doing? So I don't, I, and you know, certainly what my training as an economist did not teach me to do that. But even so, I still felt like I, I have a better feel for what's going on 
uh, uh, having uh, uh, done that. I wish I had more training in that. I wish I'd spent more time in practice than I did. All that said, I still think the, the training in econ also still gives you some sights, ability to see certain arguments that you wouldn't see without the background, which is what to say. Um, there's several, life, many lifetimes work of, of things you'd like to learn before you can do all this stuff well. Yeah, I mean, I want to now turn to Sean. Uh, Sean uh, has uh, one of his many lines of work is these sort of intricate stories of people who are litigating with perhaps questionable motives. And I'm kind of curious as to how you got into that and uh, how learning about these people affected your view of human nature. <laughs> <laughs> Confirmed it. <laughs> so I, I have slides. So right, I, mean, I remember over. that you have yeah, slides. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> but do we have a machine that's like? I think so. I think he, he showed me if I just push that button. And then nothing will happen, he said. <laughs> oh, there it is. Oh, almost. <clears throat> it's, uh, my slides are not just blue. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think it will come on. Here we go. No, it doesn't. And then it didn't. Oh, maybe if I push the space bar. So do we have a tech person? So the trouble is I can't even yell at my kids without slides. And uh, um, I will go out and, um, and uh, call for reinforcement. Okay. <laughs> oh, if there's even just like a password, I think it's asking me for a password. Yeah, and then maybe then it'll work. <clears throat> oh, yeah. In the meantime, I'll thank Claire because I have to say, um, uh, Claire and I have been friends for many years, and and I have learned so much uh, from Claire, and Claire has always been. Uh, so interesting to me as a colleague. Um, and so when Claire invited me to come and give, uh, give a talk about the new legal realism, there it is, see, perfect, it's got it, got it, got it. Oh, it's there, you're there. Sorry, okay, uh, let's go back to your first slide. I said, I, said uh, I would love to, what's the new, sort of like Dawn, what's, what's the new legal realism? And she said something like, well, it's, um, it's how, it's nuance or, or how, um, how the elegant theory connects to the messy real world. And I, and I felt sort of like the character in the Moliere's play, The Bourgeois Gentleman, and felt discovered that, you know, I've been speaking prose for all these 40 years. We've all we've been doing uh, uh, legal realism, or new, the new realism for all, uh, all this time. So um, as Claire says, my work is, uh, tries to sort of connect um, um, the, the high-minded theory uh, that Brett was describing um, to, what, to what actually happens in the trenches. And I am going to talk about litigation tomorrow, but because this is the tech panel, I thought I'd do like a techie thing for, t for today, um, which is to say, like, how, how can new technologies um, uh, help, us, uh, can help, help us see the new, um, the new realism? And so my example for this talk is about uh, mutual fund voting. So first slide is, I have this other paper, which is great, and I hope you'll all download it many times from, SS, <laughs> from SSRN. Um, which is basically a pure theory paper and asks the question of like, um, how should mutual funds, especially index funds, um, engage in voting uh, with regard to the portfolio companies that they own? And, um, and it uses two, just like two very simple, uh, common uh, uh, economic ways of thinking about it, information problems, and a uh, common purpose problem and asks like, well, okay, so if you invest in a mutual fund, like what do you want your mutual fund? How do you want them to vote on things that commonly recur uh, in shareholder voting? And the, well, the, the paper is just a pure theory paper. It says, look, you want, you want mutual funds to ex exercise their discretion in voting on contests, which is to say those situations where they have an information advantage like when the company is attacked by an activist or an acquirer, but you don't really want them to vote in ESG uh, because A, they don't have an information advantage <coughs> relative to either the manager or maybe the, owner, the investor, um, and B, um, they, they can't assume a common purpose unless the shareholders opt into a special purpose uh, fund for those purposes. So in either of those two cases, I say like the mutual fund shouldn't be voting or they should be not voting in some special way. Like maybe they should be delegating to management's choices or maybe they should be abstaining because in the context of uh, governance um, issues, there's a conflict at least. But then I ask myself the question, well, look, <clears throat> 
with these latter two categories, what if we could just pass the votes through to the ultimate investors? Like, okay, I get that maybe the theory says we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't have the mutual fund exercise discretion with regard to those things, but what if we just pass the vote through? And that's the tech part, because you'd need like really highfalutin technology to do that, like a computer. <laughs> and, and so what if you could have a computer uh, and you sign up when you're an investor and when you go on to like your Vanguard or your Fidelity or your BlackRock account, and when you sign up for the 500 fund or whatever it is, you get to say what your preferences are with regard to ESG voting. And so you would get a prompt. And the prompt could be very specific or it could be very general. And it could say something like, look, you know, thanks for investing in us with us. What we, what we can do is vote your proportional interest in all those many securities that you hold in our Vanguard 500 fund. Um, when, they, when the vote comes up, how would you like us to vote with regard to ESG issues? Would you like us to vote for ESG proposals? Vote against them. I would vote against them. Vote against them or vote, you know, some other way with management or abstain. And, uh, you know, uh, so this is the beginning of, the, of what I think is maybe the, the, um, the new realism insight. And I said, hang on a second. If you could pick, if you're, if you're picking how you want to vote your ESG as an investor in the Vanguard 500, there's a difference from the way that you're approaching those issues from the way that you're approaching them if you're like a concentrated owner, like if you're an investor in a couple of uh, securities. Why is that? Well, when you invest in a mutual fund, your uh, economic return is diversified, right? It's fractionalized. So if you're investing in the Vanguard 500, your economic return doesn't really depend on any one of those 500 companies. It depends upon the, you know, the beta or whatever, alpha, I forget which one, beta, I think, the market performance of all 500. And so your, your economic return is slivered, but your if insofar as ESG is a political question, your political opinion is coherent, right? You're not, your political views aren't divided up over 500 different ways. You actually know what you think about ESG and you think it all the time. So if that's true, what the, what the mutual fund vote sort of puts you in a position to do is to separate economics from politics. Right? Now, all of a sudden, your economic return is separate from the way in which you view politics. And maybe if you're given this kind of a preference registration choice in connection with mutual fund voting, you will actually vote differently from the way in which you would vote uh, if you were a concentrated owner. So my research project um, with, uh, and I'm doing this with, uh, with Jill Fish and my PhD student, Abby Marcus, sort of designs an experiment, and I'd love to hear uh, thoughts and comments on whether this is a sensible project, uh, designs an experiment and sets up two kinds of surveys, right? So this is very new legal realist or something, right? Asking people questions. And it, so there's randomized um, on, on the Amazon, the MTurk survey, asking two questions. So two different groups. One group is set up uh, in a hypothetical that gets them, it sets them up as, only, both, in both cases, you inherit the shares because uh, otherwise you would have picked them. And if you pick them, then you have priors about the companies that you're picking. So let's say you inherit your shares from a dead relative. And so you inherit shares of an oil company, and then you get a shareholder proposal. And the shareholder proposal says, look, um, we, would, we care about climate change. And, and as all shareholder proposals say, we would like the company to do a report to show how it is in keeping with various climate um, change um, uh, issues. Uh, and and the, the board of directors, as the board of directors always does, recommends that you vote against it. Um, but here it is. How would you like to vote on the proposal? So one set of, of, of our uh, subjects will get a set of these kinds of questions where they're concentrated owners and they're asked to just answer, vote for, against, or abstain on these different um, questions. And then another set is set up in a different way. So instead of inheriting uh, concentrated ownership, they inherit their dead relatives' uh, mutual fund. And the mutual fund is like the Vanguard 500. It owns all these things, including oil company, right? And then they're asked in a preference registration format to give their view on exactly the same question. So uh, companies within our portfolio are often asked to produce reports on how the company uh, deals with climate change. For example, one of the companies in our portfolio, Oil Co., got this proposal last year, gives the exact same proposal. And then says, ordinarily, the board of directors recommends a vote against, gives the reason for that, which is that the uh, board uh, says that they're unnecessary and costly. 
um, and then asks how they would vote for or against or abstain. Um, my conjecture is that when your economics are separated from your politics, if that's true, right? This is, I, hope, I hope it's true because I really want to coin that phrase. Um, uh, then you will vote, you're, you're more likely to vote for the proposal, other things being equal in the context of a mutual fund. You're like, more likely to vote your politics in a mutual fund than you are in a concentrated ownership situation because there in the concentrated ownership situation, you see the trade-off between politics and economics. Whereas if the economics are separated from politics in a mutual fund scenario, you don't see the trade-off as clearly or the or the economic trade-off is diversified, and the, poli the political trade-off, the political interest is coherent. So um, that's sort of my example for a, a new, I, I think this is a new legal realist uh, research project, which is kind of techy. From my perspective, what's interesting about the tech is, the, is what tech shows us about our underlying assumptions um, or, our un or the unseen complexities in the way in which our, our assumptions work. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, um, and that's... Oh. Okay, um, so Usha, I just uh, thought we would go seriatim at first and just have you talk about um, just how getting into the weeds has informed what you uh, do and think about. I remember when you came and talked about your blockchain stuff, we gave you some difficulties about contracting theory. Yeah, yes, so. that's right. Um, and my... Um, my Claire, Claire has made me the bridge, and I'm not really <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm going to take some license with bridge. Absolutely. Because so uh, Claire's right. I um, I got in. I, the tech aspect is the the blockchain, and I've thought a lot about the blockchain and and pro smart contracts on the blockchain and um, how how contract theory sort of has come to to has, what's the word, wrecked on the shoals of, of smart contracts and perhaps vice versa in that um, smart contracts code, uh, are coded on the blockchain and the idea is that it will just execute, right? Um, and there's examples of where there are problems, right? That the coding is uh, faulty or that there are problems that uh, we'll talk later about incomplete contracts and that contracts are necessarily incomplete and if if contingencies arise, so contract theory has predicted that, that contingencies will arise that you won't have thought about ex ante, but if the code is just running, then we have a problem. And uh, there's a really fun example of that that resulted in a, a very large $50 million hack, if you can call it that, um, that has been talked about a lot in the blockchain context in a decentralized autonomous organization. Uh, so that's one theory um, and practicality, I guess, interaction. Then I've written also about, I don't know if this is theory or doctrine as much, uh, that a lot of early... Um, offerings, what are called initial coin offerings, which are how early days these um, these these uh, organizations raised money was um, by way of these initial coin offerings and and ways to avoid the Howey test, right? That that idea. So the the argument is always these aren't securities because, and you saw this sort of cat and mouse between the SEC and the uh, organizations saying. Well, okay, if, if you call classify this as a security, we're gonna tweak it in this way to evade um, to evade regulation. So we don't have to register uh, as an initial public offering. And I wrote a piece about how that reality really, I mean, if, if we go back to the the theories of securities regulate, why we have mandatory disclosure, it's because um, of the benefits of standardization and that you can rely on the market, right? So there are all of these reasons why uh, the ICOs should actually want to be securities if we think that the theory works, right? Because mandatory disclosure allows for, and, and the imprimatur of the SEC allows for, for actual trading in a way that should be better than what we're getting in evading regulation. So that's sort of that's sort of an interesting question for me. 
as to how why that's not working or 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 um, how how we as a society are going to deal with that question. So then finally, and I don't know that this is technology at all, but this is I haven't told you this, Claire. Oh, now Claire's like, uh oh, where's she going? Um, but it occurs to me, I, I am doing new realism in, in, in my current project, which is on whistleblowing. And uh, this sort of funny thing about, so Sarbanes-Oxley 2002 is the first protection for whistleblowers uh, in the context of, of securities. And so Congress says, okay, we need to, Enron and WorldCom, we need to protect whistleblowers from retaliation. And where's the whistleblower office for protection? It's in OSHA. So we're gonna put it in OSHA. <laughs> so this is what happens, right? If you're a whistleblower under Sarbanes-Oxley, then you file your complaint with OSHA and um, then OSHA <coughs> investigates. And then uh, if there's an appeal, then it goes to the administrative law judge in OSHA. And Congress doesn't really say why it does that, but it does that. And then along comes uh, Sarbanes-Oxley. I mean, excuse me, along comes Dodd-Frank, 2010. Also protection from retaliation for whistleblowers. And Dodd-Frank says, well, you can file directly in court. And so it turns out that there are theories about what works better an agency or a court, right? And you can think, well, a federal agency is gonna be better at sifting out because, I'll take a step back, we have with whistleblowers this sort of, these two competing narratives, the two competing theories, right? One is the whistleblower as the noble voice in the wilderness who says, this is wrong and I'm gonna say something about it and that whistleblower needs to be protected. But then there's also this narrative from the employers of this is a gadfly, this is a person who's looking for a nuisance settlement, and um, there's so many of these suits that lack merit that we have to settle and deal with. So, so that's the underlying problem, is how do, we get, how, do we, how do we protect the meritorious whistleblower, and how do we screen out the chaff, right? And there's theory about which is going to be the better sorter in, ver in a variety of circumstances, including this one. Is it the agency with its expertise and its know-how and its training? Or is it the court system and the fact that a plaintiff who, who is going to file in court knows that she is going to be carrying the court costs or at least convincing an attorney to take the case? Which is going to be a better sorter? And I've got some data, and we're gonna see. So uh, uh, I, we can talk a little bit more about that, but there's my bridge. There's a whole lot of bridges. Right. Yeah, well, I just have to say one quick thing about this, because we, it's easy for us to talk about you know, scholarship and practical applications, but I just happen to want to bring this particular thing back to, to pedagogy, which is that my first year contract students, whenever somebody's getting fired for whistleblowing, they're always absolutely convinced that the whistleblower is of the first virtuous variety and the employer's bad, bad, bad for having gotten rid of them, and that indeed, how dare an employer not try to encourage lots of whistleblowing? It doesn't occur to them that the psyche of the whistleblower might be some, you know, somebody who's a dissatisfied crank um, who just complains about things a lot. And once you point out to students that this is their prior, they're like, oh, yeah, hmm, makes a good point. I actually know somebody who I see complaining at the store all the time. <laughs> you know, it's like, what are they complaining about? What's their problem? And then you can sort of push, but I think that you need the kind of, you know, what priors the people have. And I just, I like the idea of helping students discover their own priors. Anyway, so Rob, um, Okay, <clears throat> so yeah, cross the bridge. I think yeah, the bridge was uh, from from the rest of the folks over to the computer nerd here, um, <laughs> and um, what I. <clears throat> 
what I'd like to talk about in the context of law and tech is um, something that I spend most of my time doing, which is examining um, text and documents, uh, mostly using computers, but other other approaches as well. And um, the reason why I think this is really important uh, to talk about, especially for the students in the room, um, as you know, a potential future avenue is that uh, you may or may not realize it yet, but most of what most attorneys do is mess around with documents m- most of the day and most of the night. Uh, and <clears throat> what that includes doing is not, in most cases, especially in the transactional setting, is not writing them from scratch. It means copying things uh, that other people have created that presumably embody the wisdom of the crowd or at least some sort of evolutionary process towards making them better. And um, you can you can never sit down and write a merger agreement from scratch. You have to copy one that was used before the form that Claire was talking about, sometimes called a precedent document. Um, and um, w- one of the things that really got me uh interested in this was the fact that there hadn't been really any systematic study of how lawyers copy things and then what they the uh, what they the edits that they make the things that they leave out um, and how that process goes forward and tomorrow we'll be talking much more about that when uh, uh, with uh, me too Glotti and and others who've studied this in other contexts um, but um, the lesson I think from um, that I could just say from my own experience is that if if you uh, are willing to invest a little bit of effort in understanding um, how to manipulate text with computers and stuff like that, you can really, uh, there's a lot of low hanging fruit in the law practice and in um, academia and so forth in comparing documents and seeing what's, you know, what things have been copied from what other things and how they change over time. Um, and uh, it, um, it, indeed, some of the ideas that I'll be talking about tomorrow that I, that I came up with came out of my own law practice when I knew nothing about computers and I was just sitting there copying documents and editing them and thinking there's got to be like a hundred other documents that look almost just like this one out there somewhere. How is, if only I could see them all and see how they're different. Um, And uh, there was no way to do that back then. Um, There is now. uh, But um, the, um, so, you know, I resorted to what I'd say were very primitive technological hacks, like looking for statistically improbable phrases in a section 9.06 of the indenture and then Googling it and trying to find other ones that were like it to see how different mine was from that. And then when I went out and talked to attorneys about this, I found out that lots of other people had independently come up with the same little innovation. And I, you know, about one in 50 corporate lawyers I talked to said, oh, I do that too because you want to find word for word the exact same document to compare it to so you're not translating apples back to oranges and um, I think law firms who are interested in innovation who are interested in making fewer mistakes who are interested in accelerating uh, their processes and decreasing their costs I think they're very interested in um, in uh, systematically examining the documents that they create um, to see how their lawyers are functioning, uh, to leverage their work product, to make all of those uh, to make their processes more efficient. And um, you know, but but it's I, I I will say I don't think I have ever figured out the right formula for doing that. So it's still out there, um, and I think it's something that some smart person in this room, if you're willing to learn. Just just a little bit, just enough about uh, computer programming that you can, you know, write prototypes and stuff like that. Um, somebody is going to figure it out and uh, somebody is going to make the process of transactional lawyering. I'm thinking of in particular, the same thing happens in litigation, I know, um, but uh, make those processes much more efficient, much better, much more enjoyable. Um, for the people who do it because the rote tasks will be automated. Um, And I think um, it will also lead to academic discoveries, you know, um, about uh, about why uh, law practice in many cases looks like it does. And I think in in keeping with the new legal realism, uh, I think in many cases, especially in the transactional setting where we're creating documents, a lot of the documents that we have that we deal with 
are not um, the way they are because they're optimal. They're the way they are because they've followed a path dependent process of copying and recopying with errors uh, or just r- random insertions and things that, that have that have made them what they are today. Um, and so that obviously leaves room for, for improvement uh, in many cases, but it also leaves a lot of room for us to understand what we're actually doing um, and to, um, to, to leverage, uh, leverage technology to make it easier for us to, to see, um, to see what we're, what, what we don't see when we read the document. So the example of the inserting the name, someone's name into the document, uh, you know, one time I had a student write in the exam on like page 17, are you reading this? (laughs) Um, yes, I wrote yes. Um, uh, but, um, you know, that those types of things just stand out immediately when you, uh, compare it to similar text in a computer because they're never in there, right? When, uh, if I insert pay Rob Anderson $1 million, whereas if you're just reading the thick boilerplate uh, and you're on page 87, like there's a good chance you're not going to catch it. Um, and so I'd like, you know, that's my sort of small little world of expertise is comparing documents to one another and trying to glean insights from that. Um, and uh, I would, um, you know, as all people do, I would, I would really, for those who you know, want to be relevant in the law firm of the future. It's, um, I think this is a skill that not everyone needs, but if, if it's of interest to you, it's a skill that I think is well, well worth an investment of your resources to, uh, it's, you know, it's changed my academic career and practice career. Um, and, uh, and I'd I'd love to talk to people about, about this small little element of the tech world. Okay, let me open it up for questions. We can also ask each other questions and I have questions for many of you, but, Let's see with uh, people. Andy, you have that, I have a question look on your face. I do, but I, I don't know if it's appropriate. But Robert, um, in your work, are you primarily empirical then, or more theory? It's not more like empirical. Yeah, yeah, my work is mostly empirical. So, I mean, the main the main paper I'm thinking of here is I wrote a uh, paper called the inefficient evolution of merger agreements, which was the first one I ever did along this line where we just went out and got 13,000 merger agreements from the SEC's Edgar database and found out which ones were copied from which other ones um, and how they were different. And, you know, we sort of saw the beginnings of that. Basically what was happening was that they were, they were drifting over time. They weren't reverting back to any forms, which is what I had assumed would be the case. Uh, they were just continually going farther and farther from their originals so that, you know, for any provision of a merger agreement, which pr- practitioners think of public company merger agreements as being fairly boilerplate and, and similar with a few exceptions, you know, the due organization that the company was duly organized and validly existing, there's, there's hundreds of different variants of it. For no reason, um, not because of any substantive reason, just because they evolved uh, apart, they sp- speciated, um, and so and so now you've got all these different variants, which make it almost impossible to automate the process of reviewing these docs. Now, I don't, contrary to my co-author, I don't think someone planned it this way the, to increase legal fees. Um, I think it was just a random process, but it's a random process that didn't actually need to occur if people were able to just see two generations back what the document was because then they'd see all the edits that had been put into the last generation back that were unique to that situation and didn't need to be uh, duplicated. Could you possibly track that against the trajectory of who went where in law firms and yeah. compare, for instance, a cravat where people are all internal to, or a wachtel where people are all internal and they have more co- control over their firm models from other firms which are comprised of groups of laterals that all came together. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was it's striking when you look at it. People tend to copy their own previous work product um, for, for, for good reasons, actually. They know it. Yeah, they know it. Um, but actually, in, in some ways, I think that uh, I, I didn't test whether, you know, particular firms were more, more cohesive or not. What we found actually was that the most cohesive firms were actually probably the ones you wouldn't expect the Silicon Valley firms because they were clearly using a form. Um, and other firms uh, weren't, not in all cases, but there were, th- in, in many cases they were. Um, and, uh, but um, what's interesting about it is that, um, you know, you wouldn't think, I, I, I think this is in keeping with the new legal real, you wouldn't think that an experienced mergers and acquisitions partner would need to, um, 
would need to use their own work product because they, they don't have the ability to process other work product. You know, you would think that that would be almost an instant uh, thing for them, but it's not. It's really, really hard to penetrate these legal documents, even if you really know what you're doing. Um, and uh, and as, a, as a result, um, just seeing the literal word for word edits of how the text has changed over a couple of generations can can um, can uh, can make even uh, experienced legal practitioners um, avoid mistakes that they otherwise otherwise make. Okay. Yes. Uh, it might be a little bit uh, different from what you discussed today, but with the technology uh, development, such as uh, like uh, supercomputers like uh, Watson, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, we've seen meteoric development recently. Uh, in 30 years, 50 years, do you think there will be lawyers <laughs> in this world? Yes. <laughs> 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 I do. <laughs> I mean, I, I, as it occurred to me, as, as, as Rob was concluding, that I think in some ways what we're saying in different ways is that law helps you ask the questions, right, and figure out what questions to ask. And the theory helps you figure out what questions to ask. And then the technology will help you answer, get better answers, right, maybe more um, robust answers, deeper, more profound answers. But, but the challenges keep keep going and there needs to be lawyers that will ask those questions and apply, figure out how to use that data effectively. The law practice might look very different than it does now, but I think there will be. Yeah, I think, I, I, I mean, I agree with that. I'm, I'm, I'm not a skeptic about technological progress. I think it's, it's occurring. It's irreversible. You have to, the only thing to do is embrace it um, and develop tools that will allow you to succeed in that, in that world, which, um, but um, as somebody who's actually tried to develop AI tools um, and machine learning tools for legal practice, I mean, I also know how hard it is um, and how many mistakes they make um, and how easy it is for human beings to detect many of those mistakes that a computer can't. And I think um, I think for for the for the future that I can foresee, which is you know only a few you know maybe five to five ten years ahead, um, I, I don't uh, I don't see. Uh, I don't see lawyers being replaced, in, at least in large uh, measures, I, uh, large to a large degree. I see them being augmented, for sure. Um, and I see the cost of legal transactions being reduced. Um, and I see uh, lawyers who embrace these tools early. Um, having a competitive advantage. I mean, for example, blockchain is a great example of that where very few people um, understand it, like really understand it. And if someone says blockchain, you know, at a conference, I always like to delve into the details with them a little bit or smart contract. And about 80% of the time, they're unable to answer any question. They just, all they know is blockchain and smart contract. Um, and uh, and there's literally nothing more to that than that, to their knowledge than that. Um, and, um so as a result, I've seen students, you know, who who otherwise perhaps were undistinguished in their, um, you know, law school uh, coursework, uh, launched themselves into incredible opportunities with hedge funds and other places because they under they took the time to understand something that. You know, most older people who are the the bosses in these organizations do not understand at all um, and cannot or, or just don't, don't want to devote the time to it. And uh, and it is an amazing opportunity uh, for people like that. And, and blockchain is just one thing. I, you know, I don't know whether it's going to be end up being hype or reality, you know, but it is. Uh, but but um, being able to process text documents, which is what lawyers do with some simple computer tools, is like another example of low hanging fruit that if you just understand a little bit, you can astound uh, law firm partners. They can't believe that, that it's possible to do something that's two lines of code for you. Um, and so, um, you know, those looking for those opportunities of things that are going to evolve and, and, and be really important in the future that are harder for other people who are more um, established in their practices to understand makes you incredibly valuable. So, so a, a, a question I have is, is what it will mean in, in terms of the distribution of law jobs and what, what they, so what you see in a lot of tech areas where tech is sort of disrupted is you get a sort of 
increasing, like there's a few winners, right? Yeah. The, peop, the people who came up with the algorithms, the, the people who really are on top of things, um, uh, who, 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 who earn a lot. And then, you know, a lot of jobs are eliminated. A lot of jobs become, you know, much. So that, that is one way in which I could see the legal world going. I could see it going another world where these tools enable you, people evolve the job to take on sort of the more softer judgmental parts of the law that, um, that, uh, uh, that the computers can't do yet, um, technology can't do yet, and then you, it becomes an aid. And, and, and so it's, it, it's a less sort of a, of a, a totally inegalitarian world. But, so I can tell different stories there, but I, I do worry about the sort of inegalitarian model. That there's a lot of losers out there among the future lawyers. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. I think it's. Um, I think there. Uh, I mean, I think. I think legal zoom is a great example. It's not really a revolutionary technology. Uh, it was more of just a daring uh, gambit, actually, kind of like Uber in some ways. You know, like you know, Uber is like, hey, don't you need a license to drive a taxi? Well, we'll we're just going to see. Um, and don't you need to be a lawyer to give legal advice and draft documents? Well, we'll we're just going to. We're just going to dare dare them and see. And, um, you know, so it's not a revolutionary technology, but it's made winners and losers. And if you are, you know, a small town practitioner or even a large city practitioner drafting wills or something, you know, or simple, uh, you know, de- uh, uh, fictitious business name statements or whatever, like your, you know, your business, your business model is toast because people can just do that on legal zoom, whereas they had to pay you a couple hundred bucks previously to do it. So, you know, there are winners and losers in a scheme like that. Right. Could happen, by the way, for law professors too, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Yes. If online becomes the way that increasing, you know, the the few great lecturers of which I am not one, yeah. you know, they they could become like multi million dollars a year. In yeah. Why are Why are we all many, you know, Why are we all giving the same? Exactly. You know, in any given law school, we're all giving the same lecture on the business judgment rule on the same day, and probably like one of us is better at it than the rest of us. So <laughs> why don't Why doesn't that one person just be, you know record that person, and then the rest of us can just be the teaching assistants and answer questions and grade the exam? Well, this is what uh, we did a uh, uh, kind of great debate. We called it, except we all pretty much agreed and we had Jerry Davis from uh, Michigan from the business school and his thing was basically the uberification of all uh, (laughs) tasks and he's like okay the school's just going to say hmm we need somebody to lecture on the rule against perpetuities we've got these 300 people within 75 miles let's see who'll pay who will bid us you know their terms to come and do this between six and eight on a such and such whatever Andy Um, I guess one question I have is, are the point, I've been struck by analogies as you've been, been talking, and one thing that occurs to me is, yes, we're talking about automation, but even before that, you had outsourcing in other areas, but in law as well, there's mm-hmm. been outsourcing of standard legal uh, tasks mm-hmm. uh, to India in some cases, and, and the question is, is it really that different, or are we already seeing sort of the direction things might go? Yeah, well, I mean, certainly, uh, I mean, I'm actually a little bit surprised that things have changed as little as they have. I asked my friends who do, you know, the biggest kind of deals and, you know, they're still dealing with the people and the personalities and the one on the other side. And it's like, why isn't the computer just writing this whole thing? And they just... I mean, part of it may be, uh, what would we call it, a public choice story or not a public choice story, a uh, private, you know, a people who are as powerful as a Wachtell partner is going to figure out some way to be indispensable in some manner that until it's really blown up will perpetuate it. And of course, they will have a counterpart who does the same thing. And oh, I need protection from this one. I need protection from this one. And so that way, the two of them are both assured of sticking around. I mean, I certainly, I go to these conferences where the, uh, something called the Gruder Institute. And every year, there's somebody who presents something about, look, we can do every single one of the contract clauses through our computers. You know, and I always ask them, how do they do stuff about reasonable efforts and best efforts? How do they verify things that are not amenable to verification? And, you know, they're like, we're working on it. We're working on it. You know, 
We'll see, but it is uh, to me a little bit surprising that I've been hearing these talks and these very confident people for a long time. And while things have changed on exactly the dimensions that have been mentioned, which is to say fairly dramatically, in a way it's surprising to me that, that there's been a little bit less change. I, I, I do have to I'll tell one other story of how, how much things have changed. When I started practice, um, you know, I'm a very eager beaver, and, and the partner said to me, you know, I need to know uh, whether or not such and such would count as a sale of substantially all the assets. And, you know, okay, I, I did a 50-state survey. I read every single case. You know, I did this in the course of my first all-nighter at a firm, which was like the first week I started. And I, of course, copied all the cases myself because there wasn't anybody there at that time at 2 in the morning. Later on, there would be. And certainly, I couldn't print the stuff out because I'm old enough that nobody was. Anyway, so um, I go in the next day and the, the partner says, so what's the answer to the question? I said, well, substantially all means X percent and such and such. And he said, how confident of you are you, is, uh, are you about your answer? I said, well, I'm very confident. I read every single case on the subject and I had them on my lap that went up like this. I said, would you like to read them? And he said, I've never read this many cases in my life and I'm not going to start now. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm not exactly sure sure what lesson one can learn from this. Um, I mean, I do. Uh, did he take oh, sorry, did he take the advice? Yeah. He, he, he wrote a line in the memo quoting, uh, I mean, saying this, giving me no credit, but you know, worse things could happen. <laughs> can I just. <laughs> well, he didn't want to read the cases, which he thought was the alternative. So I want to disagree just slightly with what, what Claire said. Claire's examples of um, where where it hasn't changed are like the Wachtell and Skadden, like big uh, public company existential deals for like massive companies where like the legal fees are as large as they are, you know, as a former Wachtell associate, thankfully, as large as they are, are a, a rounding error for the companies. Um, but, uh, and there hasn't been a lot of change there. That's true. And I've sometimes asked people in my former firm, like, why, why, like, like, why don't you at least outsource the due diligence? And they're like, well, you know, we would never do that because our clients would, you know, they want us or something, right? Which I hated when I was there. Um, but there has been change in another part of the market, and, and those are the smaller uh, deals and, and especially private deals. And I'll give you one example of a huge change, and that huge change is representation and warranty insurance. Yeah. So what private equity uh, uh, M&A deals now involve is basically an insurance product where a third-party liability insurer takes the risk of mispricing pricing, essentially. And the, the insurance is broad enough that if like you screw up in the pricing of the deal, like that can potentially be covered under the rep and warranty coverage. And then there's a multiplier for like if that affects the pricing. So like let's say that you're a small company buying another small company and there's like a, a material contract mistake in the reps, which is a $1 million material contract that doesn't get renewed. Well, if you're buying the company and you have a 12X EBITDA multiple, then the damages that you get aren't $1 million, they're $12 million and they're paid for by a liability insurer. So this rise of rep and warranty insurance over the past five years, it's really in the last five years, changes the dynamics of the smaller deal market and it changes it in such a way that where you have a repeat play risk bearer. So in those Wachtell deals, you don't have a repeat player like, you know, AI, like some big public company buys some other big public company and the other one goes extinct, right? So there's not a repeat play there and they're, they're sufficiently rare. But in the middle, middle market private equity deals, there is a repeat player, first of all, the private equity firm. But then secondly, the risk bearer, which is the insurance company. Now, once the, once the risk is off source to the insurance company, like how important is that contract? And like, why don't we automate that contract a little more? And once the risk is off-sourced, outsourced to the insurance company, don't we want streamlined due diligence also? And so I think that that might be the push for more automation in the deal market would be in these middle market private equity type deals where you've already seen this kind of real change in terms of where, who, who bears the liability. I want to say also something about um, legal Zoom because I have a legal Zoom story. So I'm... Uh, business law professor, right? I teach corporations, I teach business organizations. I do some expert witness work. I realized I should probably organize as an LLC. I'm a business law professor. Surely I can do this task. So I'm, I'm in Georgia, I'm in Delaware, and I'm looking at some stuff, and I quickly decided it is not worth my time. So I go to LegalZoom. <laughs> so I go to LegalZoom. And it was so interesting, right? What they 
the business model is built on asking you these questions and you answer yes or no, you know, but there are questions like, are you going to be a member managed or a manager managed LLC, right? How many members would you, and along the way as you're clicking through, always asking for an upsell. Well, we can do this for this <laughs> much money. Well, we can do this for this much money. That must be a large part of what the model is based on. Um, but I said, you know, I knew the answers to the questions because I knew, so it sort of guided me through where to go. And I paid my, whatever it is, $125 to legal zoom, happy, happy as a clam. I think that there is much lower down in the market when we talk about access to justice and legal apps and all of these things. I think there's the role for the lawyer in whatever rural county in Minnesota or in Georgia to, to not to be replaced, but to use these tools to lower the cost of service and to make the case to the clients that LegalZoom isn't quite enough because LegalZoom doesn't really understand your family, but I can take this app or these tools and radically lower the price of um, services. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm actually hopeful that that's the case, that it's not, that that's a place where, where we can see technology improve. Um, Don. Um, you know, it strikes me one thing nobody's talked about yet is the recursiveness or adoptability of law. Uh, it's always in motion. That's one of the things the realists thought in the, in, in the middle part of the 20th century. When you hire a law firm, you're getting advice on a dynamic that is partly because they're involved in the process of changing the law all the time in terms of how they argue, uh, what activities they take, they're, they're, they're lobbying with respect to government agencies. Once you see law as always in motion, uh, you realize that what all of you are saying is, yeah, there can be some things you can automate, uh, but it would be malpractice to try to automate beyond a certain tipping point because that's where the law is always changing uh, and, and sort of have to get into that. Good for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, Matt, you had a question. Well, I was just going to jump in on Keisha's point and the question about whether we could get an automated and we're going to lose jobs. And so I had a, a small presentation of about 50 transactional lawyers and pro bono stuff. So small firm or solo practitioner lawyers and I said the words legal zoom and everybody's like ah oh, legal zoom and then I asked well what's it done to your business models um, and the response was actually one of them was like well actually we've actually seen an uptick in business uh, because it's actually taken people who would just be operating without a legal structure uh, and it got them into an LLC and then they realized I'm in way over my head uh, <laughs> LegalZoom upsell wasn't successful. They didn't, want, they didn't feel like going to LegalZoom. Then they called their local lawyers. Yeah. Uh, we're just frustrated, and now they have to kind of, you know, with mess, but not that frustrated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, money. So, yeah, it's just an interesting dynamic. So, I mean, maybe it's a complimentary. Yeah, one thing I just uh, want to mention, some work I've done is on comparing, I did this a while ago, you know, U.S. style and contracting in various uh, civil law countries. And yes, Afra knows all these papers. And there were two things that were super interesting for purposes of what we're talking about. One of them is that one of the more detailed comparisons I did with someone who was at that time qualified as a lawyer in Germany was that I realized that at that time, when admittedly the contracting parties were more middle market repeat people, which is going to be important for this story, what you got was very, very, very bare bones contracts. Because however else the law firms competed, it wasn't on my form is bigger and better than your form. It was something else. And indeed, there were some truly standard forms. And then there were these four very authoritative professors that the courts looked to, and then there were very expansive defaults in the law. So what the lawyers were doing was something else, and the story that this was sort of a client-focused thing, well, I have to respond to this, I have to include this, I have to, 
The contexts were that different, yet somehow they didn't have to include that. Now, maybe a fair part of that story was that the reputational effects were much stronger because the communities were more homogeneous, that they would have more commonly shared norms and more ability to enforce those norms. Indeed, stuff I argued. But still kind of interesting with respect to documentation. Then, um, other stuff I did, I uh, did some research on contracts in various parts of Latin America and also other civil law countries where I found that notwithstanding the apparent advantages of shorter contracts and the fact that the long ones were being made fun of, the longer ones were uh, uh, increasingly being adopted. And why was this? Well, part of it's our fault. That is the uh, LLMs that we have here <laughs> that go back to their countries and say, how can you have this pokey contract when I could do this really long thing that covers everything? And then the client's like, do we really need this? You don't want that covered? What are you thinking? So there was that kind of effect. There was also the kind of effect of, well, with certain kinds of deals, maybe we're going to involve parties who are the kind of parties who are used to these kind of contracts. This is what I heard a lot when I interviewed people in Sweden on this subject. They're like, no, we need things that look familiar to people in, in, in uh, common law countries, especially the US and UK, because who knows, maybe somewhere down the line, somebody's going to invest in some something that does something and so on. So the point is just that with both of these stories, the documentation itself was somewhat orthogonal to the deal. And there were a lot of other things going on that made the deal documents look as they did than people trying to figure out what the client wanted and going back and forth and coming up with a document. Yes, Afra. Yes. 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 The other thing that I heard from the lawyers that I interviewed there is that um, so one of one of the ways that their big corporate law firms have expanded, it's still a very small percentage of their legal market, but mostly tends not to be the big corporate law firm, is by bringing in the lawyers um, with LLM that would practice the broad. And so one thing that they tell the client is also look, these are lawyers that are very familiar with sophisticated agreements and sophisticated sophisticated like automatically needs longer and like more complex mm -hmm. not necessarily better um but they're familiar with those kinds of agreements and we're the kind of firm that can provide you with this type of counsel and it was like a way of demonstrating quality to the clients that became really important to them it was also used as a tool it has been very protectionist about allowing the foreign firms uh, to come in. It was also used as a tool to say, okay, you don't need Rushfields or you know, Sullivan or like these firms to come in into our jurisdiction because we actually can do, we can provide to you in English the same kind of legal services that you are accustomed to. Yeah, I mean, Afra, you've anticipated my talk for tomorrow because my talk for tomorrow <laughs> is largely about how since people don't know nothing about nothing, they come up with interesting proxies to determine what counts as somebody smart, somebody respectable, somebody who knows what it is that they need to know. And that the relationship between the proxy and the thing is an interesting thing. Here they just, they're able to say, look, long, complicated. Ergo, you don't understand it. I do, I'm better, I'm smarter. And, and, and this looks like what they do in New York, yeah, and yeah. And that's kind of the chain of inferences. And how good a chain is that? Yes. You know, if you go back uh, 40 years or 50 years, people like that actually had to type out all these mm -hmm. forms. And in terms of empirical <laughs> study, it would be very interesting to compare deals back then with deals now with infinitely more complex yeah. documents mm -hmm. to see if there's really any quality improvement or if it only just compounds the whole situation and produces more chaos. And of course, more legal business, uh, and it's a you know, kind of a perverse uh, incentive here to complexify the law. Yeah, they were, I mean, I, I, so I've looked at this a little bit. My dream would be to be able to find, you know, some organization that would give a grant to digitize um, old old contracts to see how they changed over time. Um, the SEC ha has a lot of them. Um, 
<clears throat> you know, that were filed as exhibit material contract exhibits to to filings. Um, they apparently I've talked to them. They apparently don't even retain them on site anymore. They have them in a warehouse somewhere. So it's like be a really big process. But there's that, and then there was the <clears throat> at least in the transactional context, there was the there was the Edgar database, which suddenly made all of these things publicly available. And it'd be very interesting to see two two things, both the word processing and the ability to copy and paste, and then the um, the the general public availability of contracts on the internet, which makes them easily copied and pasted to see how those two changes affected um, the text of the agreements. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if I'll ever fulfill that dream of finding an organization that actually wants to fund that. But, um, but I think it would be, I, th- I think it'd be incredibly interesting. And um, just on what one small example of that, I mean, John Coates and, and, and I not together separately, but have both found the same thing, which is that over the last um, 20, 25 years, for example, mergers and acquisitions contracts have about doubled in size, uh, length in the number of words of them. Um, and so, um, some of that's probably word processing, but it was like a linear change, not a, you know, so, it, so I don't think it can all be attributed to word processing. Um, and, um, you know, he and I have a little debate about why that is the case, but um, but definitely changes have been occurring, and I think my personal perspective is that, that is that most of it has not been an improvement. It's been um, it's been just um, you know baggage that accumulates over time. Okay, we have time for two more audience questions. Yes, it's not a question, but um, sort of re- reflection on some of the comments. I'm at the bottom of the IRRB of business law practice. We don't do mergers and acquisitions. I deal with immigrant clients. We don't know very much about the law at all. Uh, we often try, they, they come in exactly like the uh, folks in Utah. They say, I want a discount because I've already done my articles. I've already done my articles. I say, actually, we have to fix your articles. <laughs> uh, in that perspective, um, Yes, people are trying to do it themselves, but I think there is some job security for attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> All this access to justice has led to an incorporation form from the Secretary of State. <laughs> Six or seven questions or lines for entries is still possible and easily possible to get it wrong. <laughs> um, but the area that's, that, that's more of interest is I do applications uh, that go to the government for businesses where they have to get approval and enroll in, in certain programs. It doesn't require an attorney to do that. My main competitor is a non-attorney. But there are very few of us who do that. Um, The complexity of the rules continues to grow. And so even the non-attorneys are having trouble keeping up with that. Um, Even though basically our things take the statute and put it into the policies and say, we will follow the statute. Um, When that statute continues to grow, it becomes harder and harder for the non and there's this element that, to go back to Woodrow's question at the beginning, there's this great insecurity, and maybe it's more among my immigrant clients than others, that they're going to get something wrong. Uh, and we better check with the attorney. The attorney, of course, will get it right. <laughs> uh, and that, that security provides, that provides job security for the attorney. Uh, if the clients are insecure, even if they could do it themselves, they still say, in a sense, it goes back to Don's recursivity. So we'll, yes. we'll basically, we'll, we'll save ourselves as a profession, profession by creating more work for everyone. Okay. Uh, time for one more question or comment. How about from somebody here? Well, Sean, I'll ask you a question as our last thing we do, which is to say, um, so you're doing this on Mechanical Turk? Yes. Um, are you asking people... Um, whether they think that their vote will have an effect, and if so, what? I wonder how that might differ between whether they're making, anyway. Yeah, well, we're controlling for things, I mean, so that's a good question. I mean, we are, con- we, so we're trying to control for uh, things like financial sophistication mm-hmm. and, and stuff like that, but we're not telling them, uh, so we're not telling them one way or the other about how important their proxy vote is. And the answer of that is, of course, not important at all <laughs> for the reason that you said, which is that it won't affect anything. But it's also not important for the reason that if they pass, right, if the if the shareholder proposal passes, it's just a precatory proposal to the company, please form a committee to please write a report to please 
think about this. So, you know, it's, it's you know, unimportant squared, but we're not uh, telling them that because I think the, 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 the question is whether the, um, what the intuition is whether there, there's a difference between how they behave um, uh, just given the ownership structure. Yeah, but the question is, do they think different? Might, maybe the difference yeah. is attributable to some kind of either, to something else we can think about, like some identity thing. I am the sort of person yeah. who, as opposed to yeah. focusing on the individual. So there's there's a one, one control that we have is, um, so there are four kinds of questions that we're asking in the survey. One is about climate, one is about gun control, one is about board diversity, and one is about something else that you would be able to think of, right? And uh, uh, um, uh, money and politics. And, um, and then we ask them to slide their preferences on how important these issues are to them in general. Now my, my, now, my presumption, we don't have any of this back yet, but my guess is that people that really care about those issues will vote consistently, you know, and, and so there won't be any variation, I think, on, on the tails, right? Either like, I don't care, I will always vote against it, or I really care, I'll always vote for it. But like in the middle, that, that's kind of of where I, where I would think that we would see the trade-off if we see the trade-off. Okay, well, uh, let me uh, hope that uh, people, thank you for your attention. I know it's late, and tomorrow morning, it won't be late, it'll be early. So you should all be here, and we'll say things that are so interesting, you won't believe how interesting they're going to be. <laughs> tomorrow morning. <laughs>